I am very grateful for this opportunity to be with all of you this evening. Thank you all for coming. Emerson has written that the truest life is to be living your highest dream while you're still awake. And I feel very much like that at this moment, to be with all of you in this most beautiful abode of Yashanavanti. First of all, I would like to thank them for opening the doors to their house to several thousand people. Let us extend our gratitude by chanting Haribo. And to my very dear father, he doesn't like me to say his age, but he's 87. <laughs> and he's traveled all the way from Chicago, Illinois, in the USA, 10,000 miles, just to be with all of you. This is how much you have conquered his heart by your goodness in your friendship. And in my own life story, the way I left home in search of truth and how I totally shattered the hearts of my parents. And when I came home after living in caves and jungles and riverbanks for years, not only did I shatter their hearts, but I bewildered their minds. <laughs> they thought that having a son who's a hippie is the worst it can get. <laughs> but when I came back from the Himalayas, they realized how bad it could get for a parent. And now to see how they are so proud and so happy to dance and sing with devotees and best of friends, it, it gives so much pleasure to my heart. Thank you, Father, for being here. And over the past 50 years, we've been closer than brothers, although his life is very different, just by looking at us, anyone could see. <laughs> Doesn't take a philosophical dissertation to see that we have different lives. But I often say, one time Gary told me, what do we have in common? I'm a physical trainer telling people that if they have a strong, healthy body, they'll be happy, and you're telling people that you're not your body, you're a soul. <laughs> And I repeated, Srila Prabhupada, my Gurudev, that the body is a temple, a temple of God, where the soul resides. So Gary, you teach people how to keep their temple really nice and fit and aesthetically pleasing, and I'll try to tell them what to do inside the temple. <laughs> We're a team, and we've been a team ever since. Thank you, Gary, for coming. Let us welcome him. And two of my very dearest friends, Marjorie and Joe. Marjorie is one of the most open-hearted, sweet-natured, spiritually minded, wonderful human beings I've ever met. She's like a mother, a sister, a daughter, a friend, and everything else. Everything except a wife. 
The swamis are not supposed to have those. <laughs> Such wonderful lady. And I've known her for some years and it's just been beautiful. And her good husband, Joe, Joe Walsh. What can I say about Joe? He's one of the most famous human beings in the Western world and hopefully soon in India too. But his his band, The Eagles, is the most successful band in the history of America. Their record album is the largest selling record album in the history of America. And if the people he knows and the people who love him, it's just incredible. He's a historical legend in his own time. But yet, so humble, unassuming, down to earth, such a loving person. To balance the two of great success and still remain very humble and affectionate and kind and charitable is very, very great challenge that few people are able to do. When he plays in concerts, 40, 50,000 people come. And not like tonight, they have to pay. <laughs> if we charged for me tonight, there'd probably only be a couple people. <laughs> but Joe is just such a loving friend and it's a dream of mine that Marjorie and Joe have both come to visit with us in India. And my hope and prayer, Marjorie and Joe, is that you really feel in your hearts that this is your family and that we are your family because you are certainly our family. Thank you very much. And let us very loudly and very enthusiastically welcome them. Ten million times louder, please. <laughs> and we have my god brothers and god sisters that have come from far distances. We all know our beloved Shamsundar Prabhu, one of the dearest friends, personal servant of Prabhupada, secretary for many years. He's the first devotee practically I ever met in Amsterdam. He gave me a, a dripping lump of fruit salad <laughs> in my hands and then walked away. <laughs> but Prabhupada loved him. To know him is to love him. And also, my dear god brother Madhu Sudan and his wife Kanchapeli and Chintamani, his daughter, they came to Krishna consciousness in 1966 at 26 Second Avenue, and they've been serving ever since faithfully. And we have my dear god brother Narasimha Nanda Prabhu, who has been all the CDs and videos of Srila Prabhupada and so many other beautiful venues have been produced, created by him. If I had many hours, I could speak about these people more appropriately, but time is short. Let us very enthusiastically welcome them. Echo, human echo. <laughs> Gratitude is a divine virtue 
that is so important that practically no other divine virtues could exist without it. Spirituality grows like seeds within the field of our heart. The goodness of our lifestyle protects that seed. Our spiritual practices like chanting God's names and reading scriptures and doing service seva for God and for others is like watering that seed. But gratitude is what makes the ground fertile so that all of these other virtues will actually have its maximum effect. A fertile soil allows the seed to have deep roots and grow very strong. And for that, a grateful heart is essential. Gratitude is to see beyond the immediate circumstances that come upon us but to be actually seeking the essence of that situation. To seek the essence is real wisdom. And the essence of every situation, we can find a beautiful opportunity to grow if we are grateful. Grateful for success and failure, honor, and dishonor, happiness or distress, health or disease, victory or defeat, heat or cold, pleasure or pain. Because in all of these situations, there's an opportunity to learn something, to become better, and to grow. And ultimately, in every situation, it is an opportunity to take shelter of the higher power of God. And it is in that taking shelter that we find that life has inconceivable treasures at every moment. To seek the essence means to look for the hand of God in every situation. And this is the actual definition from a spiritual perspective of success. Gratitude is to honor, recognize, and appreciate everyone and everything for a higher purpose. I'd like to tell a story about gratitude. And in this story, there are other lessons as well. It's from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Many of us know it. A five-year-old little boy, his name was Dhruva. This happened long ago. His father was the king, Uttanapada, who, like many kings in those days, had two wives, Suruchi and Sunita. Little Dhruva, he came to his father's throne where the king was sitting with Dhruva's stepbrother on his lap. And this little boy, looking up at his father, feeling that he gives me shelter. He's my everything. He went to climb on the lap to sit with his father on the throne. But his stepmother, Suruchi, screamed at him. 
that you have no right to sit on the throne with your father because you have been born in the womb of an inferior woman. If you want to sit on this throne, you should worship the Supreme Lord. And by his blessing, you can take your next birth in my womb. Then only can you sit on that throne with your father. This little boy was shattered. And he looked up at his father. to help him. But the king was afraid to displease that queen, so he ignored his little son. Dhruva, his heart was beating so fast. Tears were pouring from his eyes. His lips were trembling in anger. Betrayal, rejection. When you put your trust in someone, when you put your hope in someone, when you love someone, that person is positioned to give you the greatest happiness or the greatest pain. Dhruva Maharaj ran to his mother. As we would say in America, he really had the blues. He ran to his mother. His heart was broken. And his mother had already heard what happened. She was devastated. Little Druva couldn't even talk. And his mother said to him, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. The reality is, your father loves her and doesn't care about me. But little Druva, please know that if you're feeling that you want to hurt anyone, or if you feel envious towards someone, those feelings will pollute your heart and aggravate whatever situation of pain you're in. You must be forgiving. You must be patient. And see the positive opportunity. Suniti herself was even more pained than her son. Because that's the way a mother's love is. The pain of a child hurts the mother more than the child is enduring. Her beautiful lotus-like face, it just shriveled up with agony, as if it was a lotus flower subjected to the burning hot summer sun. She cried. Her voice faltered. But still, she had to say something. She said, what your stepmother said is very true. If you take shelter of the Supreme Lord, all your desires will be fulfilled. So please, my son, there's nothing I can do really to help you except turn you to God. Jufa said, where do I find God? He's in your heart. But how do I find him? She said, many great sages go to the forest to find him. Dhruva said, I'm leaving. She wasn't expecting that. This five-year-old little boy ran out from the palace, out from the kingdom, and went deeper and deeper into the jungle all alone. 
His goal? To get revenge against his father. He went to the jungle because he wanted to worship God, to take shelter of God, according to the instruction of his mother, to get a kingdom better and bigger than his father or grandfather. It is said that by the mercy of Krishna, one gets guru, and by the mercy of guru, one gets Krishna. Ishwara Sarvabhutanam Hridesh Arjuna Tishtati Because the Lord is within the heart of every living being. The Lord hears our every word, sees our every action, knows our every thought, and most importantly, understands our intentions. And as our ever well-wishing friend, just waiting for us to turn to him. When one is very serious about spiritual life and one is ready, the Lord orchestrates our life in such a way to connect to a guru or a teacher. Maybe one, maybe several who show us the path, who give us hope, even in hopelessness. The great Narada Muni appeared in the middle of this lonely, dark forest. And he found this little five-year-old Dhruva and said, what are you doing here and why are you here? You're so small. And Dhruva told him, I want a kingdom better than my father's. And I've come here to take shelter and worship God for that reason. Narada Muni said that you're just a boy. Don't take these things so seriously. There's always reversals in life. Just go home and play. The jungle is no place for a five-year-old child. Things will get better at home. Just go back. He was testing Dhruva. Narada Muni told him the secret of happiness. He said, a happy person is one who is very pleased to see someone else doing better than him or herself. When such a person sees someone who can't do as much, he's compassionate, wants to help lift that person up. And to those who are equals, becomes a friend. Now ordinarily, when somebody is better than us, especially in what we do, we become envious, jealous. We want to excel, we want to bring people down. It's natural to want to do better, but which should be in a spirit of improving ourself, not in a spirit of being envious to drag down someone else. But when someone's but when a person sees that God is gifting this person in a wonderful way and one is pleased at the success, the happiness, and the blessings of another person, that is a happy person. And instead of being arrogant or condescending toward people who are less than us, if we're their well-wishers, compassionate to bring them up, that is a happy man. And for those who are equals, 
to develop intimate, loving friendships and share what we have for the world. So he was telling these stories, these instructions to little Dhruva about how to be happy. Go home and just follow these things. And little Dhruva said, My heart has been pierced by the burning arrow of my stepmother's sharp words. I cannot hear what you say. I must get revenge. Tell me how I could know God. So Narada Muni said, go to this sacred place called Madhuban on the bank of the river Yamuna. Worship the Lord within your heart. Meditate on the Lord within your heart. The beautiful, compassionate, smiling, loving father and mother and friend of every living being. He didn't tell him to meditate on a very punishing God, but a God of grace, of love, of beauty, of kindness. And he gave him a mantra, the name of God. The mantra he gave him was Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. By chanting these names and meditating in a mood of service and offering service, then you will realize God. So little Dhruva did that. He had such determination. And after a few months of his meditation, he actually could God revealed his eternal, all-beautiful, loving form from within his heart. What is that vision? Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita that all beautiful things within this world are just a tiny spark of my beauty. We know how someone or something can attract our hearts. The name Krishna means all attractive, supremely attractive. Because whatever we are attracted to in this world, the reason the soul is attracted to things or people is because they are emanating from Krishna who's supremely, all-encompassing, attractive. One time our Gurudev, Srila Prabhupada, was on the Pacific Ocean beach, and it was a beautiful sunset. And someone said, isn't this a beautiful sunset? And Srila Prabhupada said, if you think the art is beautiful, you should see the artist. This is just a spark of that beauty. So Dhruva was seeing the beauty of God within his own heart, and he was in ecstasy. And suddenly that vision disappeared, and he came out of his meditation, he opened his eyes, and that same form of the Lord was standing right in front of him. His beautiful, beautiful eyes gazing lovingly upon this little boy and a smile, a smile that completely relieves one of all misery and surcharges one with all happiness. Drufa wanted to say prayers of appreciation, but he was only five years old and he never went to school yet, so he didn't know how to say prayers. So the Lord, knowing his heart, touched his head with a little conch shell that he was holding in his hand. And in doing so, empowered Dhruva to recite the most 
not only recite but compose beautiful songs of love and devotion that even today, thousands of years later, are still being sung by millions and millions of people. Krishna says in Gita that I am the ability in man and woman. I'm the intelligence of the intelligence, the strength of the strong. If we have a gift and we think it our own, we're really depriving ourselves of the potential happiness we can have. When whatever gifts we have, we honor it and we're grateful for it because it's a gift of God. And that gratitude nourishes our love for God, then we can experience something that is way beyond the temporary dualities of life. Then our happiness has a foundation that cannot be shaken. So Dhruva spoke so beautifully. And then the Lord spoke. He said, my child, I know exactly what you want. You want a kingdom bigger and better than your father or grandfather. And I've come here to give it to you. I'm pleased with you. And little Dhruva, with tears in his eyes, he said, I was looking for the broken pieces of glass in the form of worldly acquisition and power and fame. But you've given me yourself like the rarest jewel. I'm seeing you. I'm loving you. I'm feeling your grace. I don't want anything else. I was looking for broken glass and I have discovered the rarest jewel. I'm, all I want is to remember you, to serve you, to love you. In the Bhagavad Gita, there's a beautiful verse. Vidyavanaya sampani brahmani gavihastini suni chaiva supakecha pandita samadarshanaha. When that love of God awakens within our heart, it manifests as spontaneous, unselfish compassion and love toward every living being. Atmarama, we become self-satisfied. And there's nothing in this world that can shake that satisfaction. An ocean, because it's so deep, no matter how much rain or drought, it doesn't affect the size of the ocean. But a puddle of water, because it's not very deep, rain or drought terribly affects us. So if our internal happiness is very shallow, superficial, then the situations of this world could really disrupt our life. But if we're finding that ocean, that ocean of happiness from within, by connecting to our own essence, our own soul, our own love, God's love, param drishvani vartate, then nothing could shake that. Dhruva attained perfection. Now, then the Lord said, but now you should go home and you should perform your duties because you're the eldest son. You're going to be the next king. So go home and perform your occupational duties, but do it with compassion, with integrity, and with love. 
Meanwhile, back in the palace, the king, when he heard that he broke his son's heart so bad that he ran away from home into the jungle, he was beside himself with grief. What have I done? My son is going to die. He cannot live in the jungle alone. Because of my own craziness and attachments, I've caused the greatest pain to my own child. The king was beside himself. All he could do was think of his son and grieve. And then the stepmother, realizing what she did by her words, she was just laying in the ground crying in guilt. Narada Muni came, the guru, and said, Dhruva's coming home, prepare for him. And there was a big festival to welcome Dhruva home. He came home a saint, an enlightened being, who was compassionate and loving to every living being. His stepmother embraced him weeping, his father embraced him weeping, but mostly his own mother, Suniti. She was beside herself with joy. Now little Dhruva was effulgent with spiritual energy. It was beautiful. You see, lamentation Srila Prabhupada writes, when there's a, if we simply lament when things go wrong, nothing is accomplished. But if in a difficult situation we really sincerely take shelter of the Lord and with our own God-given abilities try to fix that situation, to improve it, to make it better, then we can reverse a curse into a blessing. And this is what happened with Dhruva. And this is oftentimes the story of the greatest successes in life. Sometimes a person hits rock bottom in life in one way or another, to to discover something so beautiful, so precious, that if one didn't go through that, they would just live a spiritually mediocre life and never accomplish much of anything so much within. This is a truth. To transform a curse into a blessing. And that's what happened with little Truva. That severe crisis of betrayal that he underwent ultimately transformed him into a saint, an enlightened, self-realized lover of God. And after some time, when he grew up a little, he became the king. And for many years, he ruled the kingdom. And I'm going to make it short because we don't have much time, even though I don't know what time it is. But (laughs) when Dhruva's children grew up, Dhruva, who treated every one of his citizens as a child of God, In family, he considered his whole kingdom, his family. It's not just my husband, my wife, my children, my parents. From a spiritual perspective, we see everyone around us in our family. This is a child of God entrusted in my care to serve to protect, to appreciate, to encourage, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. When we have this consciousness, 
then there's an intimacy of love that is far beyond just the temporary attractions. It's based on deep, unconditional love. This is God's beautiful child for me to serve. God served, I mean, Dhruva served not only his wife and his children and his father, but everyone in the kingdom in that mood. And therefore, everyone loved him. He was a servant, not a master king, a servant king. And he hardly had to make laws because everyone just wanted to do whatever he did, said, because they were happy people. And eventually he gave the throne to his son and he went to a holy place in the Himalayas called Badrigashram. And there he focused himself exclusively on his spirituality. And the time came when an airplane descended from the spiritual world to bring him to the highest perfection of liberation. He performed his services, his spiritual services, before he went on the plane because that was his service to God. Whether you're serving here or there really isn't important. What's important is that we're serving. This is the teachings we get from Lord Chaitanya on the path of bhakti. Whether we're serving in the spiritual world in the eternal spiritual body or whether we're serving here in these bodies, there's no difference in the sense because God accepts our love wherever we are. In, where, in whatever situation we're in. And then Dhruva went to all the other people who were there in his hermitage and bowed to them and asked for their blessings. Now this is a quality of a very special soul. This man was the king. And that airplane didn't come for any of the others. Juva could have been thinking, I'm going back. You're here. I'm better than you. There's no plane for you. You don't have a ticket. I do. In symbolic words. But no, he was humble. He was grateful. He bowed to every one of them to take his bless their blessings. And then he got on the airplane. And you know what he was thinking? He was thinking, how could I go to the spiritual world when my mother is here? It's only because of her that I have any spiritual value. It was she that told me to take shelter of the Lord. She gave the seed which my guru watered into the, and into the flower of enlightenment. He was feeling, now he's an old man, he was feeling from long before when he was a child, still grateful to his mother for that one word. And then he saw in the sky, there was already a plane taking his mother to the spiritual world. It is a story of gratitude. Take it as you may. The teaching, the lesson, is so critical for all of us. To be grateful to people, to be grateful for opportunities, can give us unlimited hope. The ego 
blinds us from our true spiritual joy. The ego makes us believe that we are that we are what we do. The ego makes us believe that we are what we have. It separates us from other people and separates us from God. There was a slave in America. He was doing hard labor when he was nine years old. He was African-American, being whipped, beaten, ordered around as a slave, owned by another person, bought and sold, abused. His name was Booker T. Washington. He became such a legend in America, founded institutions, colleges. When he came out of slavery, he wrote something. He said, I will not allow any man to belittle my soul by causing me to hate them. He had every reason to hate. But he was grateful. And in that gratitude, he grew out of such a difficult situation to give his life in the service of others. And he was a, whole, he was a religious man. So on the path of bhakti and the path of devotion, we understand these principles as sacred in whatever situation to be grateful. And tonight, I am just so grateful. The dearest people in the world to me are all here, so patiently tolerating my long speech. I'm sorry. We water, we water these beautiful, divine virtues within us through decisions we make and through chanting God's names.